right, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for this chance to come and speak to you. I'm glad he said some of those words because it, it, it was a bit of a, uh, I was in a pickle because the Jubilee Field has a lot of very good success points that were raised. And I, and I wanted to step back and give you a bit of a perspective of the overall FPSO record, which is not as stellar as some of the <coughs> metrics that the Jubilee Field achieved. Um, I'm a manager of the MP business area at IPA and um, have spent since 1998 there doing this kind of a company by company project analysis of many operators' projects. And that's what compiles us. So we want to give you a sense of a story about FPSO performance. And the other subtitle we might have is Great Expectations. So I want to give you just a sense of what we mean by that. Um, well, these are just words we hear month in, month out when we evaluate these projects. FPSOs will perform as well as other floating production systems. We're going to talk about that and why that's not true. FPSOs can be delivered much faster than other FPSs without any trade-offs. They can be delivered quickly, but generally they're trade-offs, and we'll quantify some of those. Risks can be transferred to the contractor. Strategies um, without any degradation of performance. That's one we hear many owner teams tell us, yet they sometimes forget that when it's producing, it's still their asset that's producing. Um, though different contracting and execution strategies and incentives, perhaps, we see creative use of those. It can be accomplished without proper definition or by letting the contractor worry about the definition. These aren't our words. These are actual statements that project teams tell us are their strategies for achieving their results. FPSO contractors are much better at defining projects than FPS contractors, which in which FPSs are semi-submersible, spars, TLPs, things of, of that nature. And what's fascinating is we have a way to do a bit of a controlled experiment with that because in the Gulf of Mexico where FPSOs were not allowed for so long, it forced some laboratories of innovation with other production systems. And so we can kind of learn from this little controlled environment um, and compare that to, to other areas. So a decade later, in 2002, I did a study where we explored the performance of FPSs and FPSOs versus other concepts. Sample of 44 completed projects, FPSOs represented half the sample. They had the worst outcomes compared to any concept evaluated. This was in 2002, driven by poor practices and extremely aggressive schedules. And you're going to hear that that's what kind of shortcuts some of the definitional work that the FPSs do, that the FPSs with fast schedule goals don't finish in general. In 2012, we, increased, we had an increased sample last year of 134 completed FPS projects. That means we have the actual costs, the actual schedules, we have the actual production performance for the first couple of years, and we have the estimates and we have the technical parameters for these projects. And all evidence suggests there's been no change in FPSO performance and it's possibly worsened since 2002. We've had a very heated market since 2006-07 where things became even more difficult to execute than they did in a rather benign time of 2002. And the goal is to establish current performance. So that's what we set out to do with this study last November. So just a quick view of our outline. I'm conscious of your, your time as well. I'm going to spend one slide describing our database so you can get a sense of what the project parameters look like in our sample. Then we're going to talk about FPSOs versus FPSs, some differences. And then we're going to focus on within the world of FPSOs. So first we're going to look at FPSOs versus other systems. And then FPSO execution strategies. You know, they're conversions, new builds. These are important decisions teams decide. Owned versus leased. So they all have some of their peculiarities that, that we'll note. And then we'll talk about some issues with FPSO definition. What constrains the definition on these floating production systems? Quick view of the data. 134 projects, of those 78 were FPSOs. Average floating system cost in 2012 US dollars was 1.5 billion, ranging from less than 300 million to more than 3 billion. 39 owners represented, 38 contractors represented in the mix. Average authorization year is 2002. 
Now some of these projects take six, seven years, some take four years from discovery, but they have long, some of them have some long lifespans to get executed. From the FPSOs, 45% were leased, 67% were conversions, and then 58% are leased conversions. Okay. So let's first look at all floating systems. One thing, we would say they're not greatly different, although you do see that floating production systems that are not FTSOs tend to be a bit smaller, a bit smaller on, on some of the characteristics. Um, you see the count, 78 versus 56. Average cost was 1.7, 1.2 billion, okay? Um, in the ballpark, comparable. 28 wells for FPSOs, 17 for other systems. Reserve size, 380, but that's quite similar. 380 million barrels versus 340. Um, a lot fewer owners in FPSs. You see that, um, that the mix in terms of majors, independents, and national oil companies for both profiles, a lot lo more majors, and of course that's deep water Gulf of Mexico being executed by majors is boosting up the sample there. Average throughput is considerably bigger for FPSOs, but still 110,000, 176,000 for FPSOs, 110. So that's the data. So we think statistically we, we, want, we can compare these two populations, but we want to tell you honestly that the FPSOs tend to be a bit smaller. I mean, the FPSs are a bit smaller on the margin than, than the FPSOs are. So let me first introduce this chart. I'm going to use it several times. It's a spider plot where we have at the top operability problems. So you're going to see various outcomes for the two populations. Operability problems means in the first year you have significant downtime that was not expected. Some kind of issue has forced you to shut in or choke back production that was not anticipated when you sanctioned the project. It's a binary. Did this happen? Did it not? A more refined way to look at it is production attainment where we're looking to see in months 7 through 12 after you first produce. We ignore the first six months assuming every project has difficulties. Are your production rates comparable to what you at sanction said you would be producing in months 7 through 12. So we have the production forecast and we have the actual production numbers. So we simply divide the, produ the, the production rates by what you said it would when you set your economics and decided to invest in this project in that month 7 through 12. Then we look at schedule slip. That's simply I mean, the first oil date is a very public thing. It's hard to hide that. Or the first gas date, we just look to see when you said it would produce to when it, when it did produce. Schedule index is where we, we're benchmarking you against your peers, like the slide the previous gentleman showed you, where we have a sense of how long it takes to, to um, execute an FPSO or your project, given your size and your scope, and we control for cost, et cetera. We, so one is... The slip is against what you promised, but the schedule index is against what industry on average takes to execute a project. So you might do it in 24 months, industry spends 30 months, and we divide 24 by 30, and that's an index. And then we look at cost growth, which is, again, de-escalated money for the two time frames, but we look to compare how much was the cost at the end of the day compared to your budget forecast. And first we'll see... For other floating production systems, we see 50% um, operability problems, but production attainment, which in your economic numbers is probably the most leveraging thing, are you producing what you promised, is 90%. That's quite good. In an industry, in the EMP industry, average production attainment for all concepts that we look at is around 82%. The average EMP project misses its production forecast by 18%. There's a bias to, an o to overconfidence at sanction. Schedule slip, 10%. Schedule index, 0.9796. So very close to industry average. Cost growth, 20%. But let's look at the FPSOs. This is where we see a hit. The production is about 70% of what was promised. Sometimes they make it up, which it sounds like they're doing in outer years. But in many cases, they need to invest in further upgrades or they have some constraints that weren't planned or they have more a gas oil ratio that's not what was anticipated and so there's some kind of revamp upgrade or another set of wells that are required to get to where they need it and that capital if we want to compare the cost should 
almost be kind of a cost growth number, if you will, but we don't always see that number. But so, but, but they, they're clearly not producing at the rates they thought they were going to. Schedule slip is 20%. The schedule index is actually industry average. So that's interesting when you see they slip significantly and they achieve industry average schedules is they're setting a target at sanction of a very unrealistic schedule and slipping it by 20% on average. And cost growth, this is, a, is a, w would get most people's attention, 30% cost growth starts to be quite difficult to, to, to hide and it, it becomes quite noticeable. So we just wanted to give you a, a quick snapshot of the difference between floating production systems and we'll explore some of the, why some of those differences are taking place. But, um, when we talk about execution strategies within FPSOs. But that's just to give you a sense. FPSOs, as a rule, are less predictable and produce at le less than what they say they would than floating production systems do. Some, uh, so why are so many, one of the, some of the issues that we see is poor definition. They tend to be more hands, we see more evidence of hands-off execution on the FPSO side than them where the owners are much more involved on the TLPs or the SPARs and the semi-submersibles. And I'm quite sure Anna Darko has a reputation, I'll bet they weren't hands-off and that I think helped make sure that they avoided some of the problems. I bet Don Vardaman was not hands-off in that project. Uh, and so I think, but many of the other cases that we have here, it was truly <coughs> the contractor knows best and that turned out to be costly. So we see functional specs. Owners define high-level requirements and expect contractor to do the rest. You can't achieve that. You have to stay involved as an owner. The successful ones, the owner stays involved. The ones that are pulling the averages down, we're, and we'll talk about it at the end, some different stark differences in cost growth. A common approach is through feed competition resulting in a winning bidder and feed package being chosen. Expectations to have a complete package given that is paid for and competitive. They are the experts who have done this before. They prefer it this way. Okay, that's just, I mean, that's not a made up quote. That's what we get told when we ask, why would you take your money as a company, billions of dollars, and hand it to someone else to spend? In some cases, the owner organizations consciously decided not to get too involved during basic engineering. And this approach may make sense for a leased FPSO, but I don't see how that makes sense if it's an owned FPSO. And I'm even, I would even challenge a bit on the edges on a leased FPSO, but on an owned one, I would, there, there's no reason that it makes sense that you'd be hands off like that. Without be, and then be surprised that your costs will grow or your production is short. So let's look into the world of conversion and new build. We've talked about that sometimes. And there, there are peculiarities for both of them. We tend to go with conversions because we think they go faster and they, they do deliver fast results, but there's some interesting differences between the populations. So I've got the same axes here, and we'll look at the new builds. Production attainment, a respectable, well, an industry average 80%. Schedule slip, around 10%. Schedule index, around industry average cost growth, 15%. Operability problems, almost 70% of the time. Now with conversions, you can see they're doing what they're meant to do. They are delivering a fast schedule. They're coming in 10% faster than average that, you'd ex that they should, but they're still slipping by 25%, which means the original schedule was somewhere around here and probably not executable by humans. But that's what we, <laughs> that, that's, the slip is generally that high. Cost growth still 30%, operability problems 80%, and the, but here's the hit. We think at sanction that this fast schedule is going to deliver us the best, ec better economic result, but we're not assuming in our economics that we're going to only produce 65% of what we're promising. And all of a sudden, if you were to run the scenario of the fast schedule with low production forecasts, all of a sudden it might be very justifiable to do a bit more appraisal on the front end, to spend another six months or a year to do some of the work, because those are the ones that are able to achieve 85, 90% of what they're promising. So that's one of the issues we're trying to raise is that people are making somewhat of a false choice when they decide 
You know, if you tell someone, I can give it to you a year faster and it doesn't cost you anything, of course everyone's going to take a year faster. But the honesty is that it actually does cost something to go that much faster. You do have a lower production. There's, you, with less basic data and less definition, it's going to come out somewhere. You're going to have some kind of a surprise subsurface. You're going to have some kind of a issue that is not planned for. And, and, and we'll talk about some of those. Industry average pro operability problem is only 43% for the EMP industry as a whole. That's platforms, that's everything we look at. So floating systems are notoriously more difficult to bring online without operability problems, and FPSOs are even more, more so. So what are some of the issues you might run into when you pursue conversion? Several of the conversion FPSOs are associated with shorter field lives, often associated with license term expirations that drives the need to reduce risk and speed up the, uh, and so speed, and we see they do deliver speed. They absolutely do. Marginal economic projects requiring reduction of capital might look better with a converted option. Contractors promise access to a hall that's available and appealing to one thing, speed. Owners love speed. But we have examples, and it didn't happen here, but we have examples where all of a sudden that, that hull is not available and you've got a different hull, and now you're stuck. And I guarantee you, uh, a conversion is like a massive revamp upgrade. And those are the worst performing projects in general in our database. The discovery is never as thorough on the revamp upgrade side. And so we see the cost growth sometimes to the point that we see almost no cost performance difference between a converted FPSO and a new build FPSO given the cost growth. When we benchmark the cost of these FPSOs, there's almost no discernible difference between a conversion and a new build. And that's because the estimate is low, but they end up with quite a bit of cost growth on the conversion side. Now, some operators are very good about, have, about inspecting that hull and guaranteeing that's the one they're going to get and doing the work that you would need to do for a revamp. Those are the successes, but that is not the norm for converted FPSOs. They plan for a schedule 20% faster than new builds. And here, let's see, well-defined conversions are a rare commodity. Look at the new build. This is a facility's front-end loading definition scale. It's an algorithm we apply where we assess based on what has been completed or not completed in terms of basic engineering work, execution planning, uh, regulatory issues, anything that we think can delay or cause growth in a project, have you, have you planned for it? And best practical is what it is. That's what we think is the, the projects in the best range have the best results, good, fair, poor, not done. It's a numerical scale, but the numbers are less meaningful, so we have some qualitative words around it. And you see that 25% of new builds are in a good level, not even 10% best. We know, but we still see 40, 35, not with very little definition done, 30% with poor, but look at what happens with the conversions. We're making, there, nothing is best defined, nothing is good defined on the conversions. So that's just bringing the light. We're getting the speed somewhere because we're not doing the work at the front end before sanction when it's cheaper to fix the problem than in execution or after you're starting up. And um, I think some of the, I just had some notes, some quotes that we get. Um, conversions and new build FPSOs, owners hand over responsibility to, why is engineering incomplete? It is most likely incomplete when the owners hand over responsibility to the contractor. Issues center around the availability and quality of the hull. Advertised hull is not available at time of execution. Inadequate hull inspection results in fabrication delays, cost growth, underestimating replacement steel for the hull. I mean, these are just the, the anecdotal issues that we run into. Um, on a new build, it's a bit more straightforward. They just didn't finish all of the engineering deliverables and had to do them later because there was such a push for, for speed. Owned and leased. This might be an interesting comparison too. So we want to just give you a very strange um, profile for the, for the owned and leased ones. We now have a different index there. We still have the same here, but we have late changes. How many of them had, had late changes once they're in fabrication or, 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 in, or in the field? 90, almost 85% with the owned FPSOs have um, late changes, schedule industry average, significant slip, 
production attainment, respectable though, a bit better than industry average, 60% operability problems. When we go to the least, we see production attainment below 60% on the least vessels. Schedule slip a bit um, less, ex less, less problematic, a bit faster schedule. Late changes not as extreme, operability problems higher. So we're sticking to the plan, we're a bit more disciplined about sticking to the plan, but we're paying for it here in terms of the production performance. Whereas here they're going to take their lumps by making some changes, but they're enhancing some of the production because the changes probably are required to make it work better, but they're, they're coming in late. And here's some differences. For when it's owned, we tend to see almost a half-step improvement in engineering definition. This is a limited study complete. This is a factored estimate, perhaps, and this would be a more of a bottoms-up estimate and much more um, completed work. This is what we would say is best practical. Significantly less engineering work done when we have a leased vessel. Again, we're going to talk about the hands-off issue. And then execution planning. If you are planning to be 20% faster than industry, but you don't have a detailed execution plan of how you're going to do that, I would be very suspicious. How are you going to do that? Is it just, are you hoping that it's all going to fall into place? The project teams that achieve those fast schedules have very well thought out execution plans, which would have been the case on, on this project. They've considered these issues and they've made, a, what is your plan to achieve something that no one, few others in industry achieve? You've got to be doing something differently. Your execution plan should be documenting that. But when they're leased, it's, um, it's, a, it's a, another step below, below what the owned ones are. So let's move on. So what are some of the drivers of FPSO definition? What's causing these projects to fail to advance in a way that we see floating production systems do, and perhaps even and platforms, other, other concepts? Let's look at it here. Schedule aggressiveness. This is probably the prime mover that cuts short appraisal, that cuts short definitional work, etc. Every project professional knows I need to complete these deliverables. It's not that they're negligent in that sense, but there's a pre push for speed. So here we have your planned schedule versus the industry benchmark. Okay? So industry average is 1.0, and they're all planning schedules that are faster than the industry average achieves. Around 90%, okay, if you have a good plan to do it, I'd say 90% is something a good, well-defined team can achieve. Owned FPSOs, these are floating production systems, but look, there's a lot of variance here. This is just standard deviation around that mean. 82%, 75% with a lot of variance. We've got FPSOs within a standard deviation saying we're going to achieve it at 64%, and there's still samples on either end of these distributions. So... I, you can't believe some of these scheduled expectations are, are just not believable because distributions tell you that they are hardly ever achieved and if you're planning them what is your plan to get there and are you paying for it somewhere else if you're planning a very fast schedule but you know the appraisal is not complete you've got to risk the production profile to reflect what industry average sees as an average downgrade or decrease or in terms of their production numbers. And let's go on. Use of incentives might overcome lack of definition. Let's see what the record is for those operability incentives. Knowing that RFEL is not well defined, we are probably anticipating production operability problems. Teams aren't surprised. The correct solution, of course, is to improve definition and get operations input but that's not what we do. Instead, we use operability incentives which penalize the contractor in the event that targets are not met. <coughs> Let me go. For floating production systems, we hardly see the use of those operability incentives. Let's see what, for FPSOs on average, 45% of the time. Leased FPSOs, owned FPSOs. This actually worsens the situation for the contractor. It doesn't pay off in the end. We see no statistical difference in production performance with those operability incentives. There's no relationship between production attainment or operability problems and use of these incentives. There simply is not. From our perspective, these incentives are, are an added complexity 
that owner project teams really shouldn't have to worry about, given all the other things they're worrying about, and they provide very little benefit to the project performance. So why make your world more complex by adding in these incentive structures? So conclusions, path forward. Uh, I just wanted to summarize here. So we had a very small population of leased new builds, and we didn't discuss those. We, looked, we didn't look at those. But conversion lease combination is the worst of all strategies. If you wanted to look and test some of the likelihood, likely results of your, they're always exceptional, but if you want to test the most likely result, the converted least approach had the worst results. Owned conversions are slightly better, while owned new builds seem to be best within FPSOs, but not as good as floating production systems. Of course, the immediate reaction is to blame the contractor, but I, I think it's really the tactics and it's not the contractor's fault in these, I, I'm gonna step in and say, it's still the owner's project, and the hands-off issue is what the problem is. One could argue that in marginally economic projects, pursuing capital reduction by way of conversion or lease is rational. Pursuing very aggressive schedules, however, is not rational, given the trade-offs that the aggressive scheduled projects experience in production. And I would even say that great performance on the schedule for Jubilee, but it's still a P75 performance. And statistics say you can't routinely target a P75 performance. Pursuing very aggressive schedules is not rational. Doing so on the back of very poor front end loading is even more irrational. Functional specs and not fully defined execution planning are essentially a hands-off approach. And so what I want to give you some numbers. More FPSOs take hands-off approach. We have about 50% of the FPSOs that we would have classified a hands-off approach. That means had all of the FPSO scope left entirely to the contractor with little or no supervision. Who does that? But 50% of the time, that is the approach. With floating production systems, that only happens 10% of the time. So you're starting to see some of the different reasons for some of the performance differences. When they're hands off, we see schedule slip of 30% and we see cost growth of 20% with the hands off approach. When it's hands on, we see cost growth of about 14% and schedule slip of around 16%. So it's it's a big difference. And so you can say the contractor did this, the contractor did this, but you're the supervisor. And so, so we still say it's an, the owner's responsibility to maintain that hands-on presence in the execution of the project. I think I'm at my, I'm at my slot. I think we're I have time for some, you tell them how much time for questions they have. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, anybody got any questions? Yes, please, over there, Angus. Thank you very much. Uh, Angus Miller, Foreign and Commonwealth Office Energy Advisor. Um, you didn't mention companies at all in any of that. Now, is part of it the bias of the companies themselves? So you might actually be viewing a company that's inefficient as opposed to a system that's inefficient. Um, well, there were 38 operators represented in that sample, so it's quite a widespread among the FPSOs. And the mix, I think, of, um, and it's almost evenly divided between NOCs and, um, and uh, majors and independents. And we have tested to see if there are company biases. There's not a company bias within, uh, now, there might not be enough. You, on the FPS side, I might see there's some company benefit. You know, Shell has quite a record of tension like platforms in the Gulf. So you would expect that eventually they're going to get some proprietary benefit and we see some of that in terms of cost performance. But within the FPSOs, we can't see any variance, uh, any differences across operators in terms of, they all have some of successes, some have dismal failures within the same company. Yeah. Another w way of asking maybe the same, yeah. uh, I mean, does it, does who is going to take a hands off approach <coughs> depend on the size of the company or does Ye it? Okay, that's true. You might see more of a hands-off approach with some of the independents and even some of the national oil companies than you would with some of the super majors and the majors. They would have, but that's also part of the reason that it takes BP seven years. Was it you who would do something that an independent can do faster? What we're trying to make transparent is that there's still a trade-off with that speed. I, I would say the majors simply cannot execute it as fast as the independents can 
and some of that is that the independents are a bit hands-off, and the hands-on approach slows things down. But I'm arguing that that very fast schedule of floating production systems is not con reliable. It's not a reliable result. Right. Yeah. right. And I, I guess another yeah. way. So. so what happens when you talk to project teams about this? Right. Do they go into denial and say, no, let us go? Or, In or, terms of? Yeah, I, I guess, I, what am I, uh, before you arrived, yeah. I was saying that there, there's clearly a mood of investors, amongst investors in, in London, right. to say development projects are, are, are the kiss of death for small to medium-sized companies' share price. I mean, is that... A, a corollary or a flip side of, 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 of this, that you know they are the ones who are handing it off and not seeing the results, or is it, are these things not connected at all? Uh, that's really what I'm asking. I think there are some independents who have a good cost and schedule track record on, on fast execution, but their production performance is as, is as mixed as it is for anyone else. There's no one, there's no operator <laughs> that you would say is stellar in all those three categories in terms of cost, right. schedule, speed. There is not one. That he, but we see teams within all of the operators who achieve very startlingly good results. And some of those are the project managers who stay, on, who stay very involved. And when they're being told by management to achieve a schedule that's 0.75 or 0.7 of what industry does, they squawk quite loudly and produce some evidence that that's, that's not a good that's going to be harmful. Perhaps a 0.9 or 0.85 is realistic, but once it starts to get to some of these unrealistic numbers from a statistical, it, it's a warning side, warning I see, flag. I see. And, and how, you, you know, if you have a s small, small company uh, that's made a significant deep water yeah. discovery, uh, I mean, they won't have a lot of people. How, how should they proceed? Should they I go think look for a partner, or, or what's well, I think what's very interesting is that we looked. At, we have a partnership of three entities in Jubilee, that complemented each other's strengths quite nicely in executing that project. Yeah. I think they really did. The only thing I might have suggested is that we, we, given the appraisal in that field, it might have been more realistic to put a lower production profile in there and make sure that that's still the decision you want to do to pursue that speed. Yeah, I think. That, and then if people with an, say, okay, going faster with this less appraisal is likely to give me, oh, actually this amount of production that first year, not this, or I might have to drill more wells, or I might have to do something else, you might then make a more open-eyed decision to pursue another appraisal well. Yeah. Or you, know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really, we're not saying don't go fast, don't, but we're, we're saying most of the time they're not making an honest comparison between those two scenarios. Yeah. Do you think... Uh I mean, one of the things I would assert... Is and I, that honesty is the wrong word. They don't know. Yeah, yeah it's They not, don't it's know what the likely outcome is with that limited data. And do and you think companies are increasingly under-appraising? I mean, obviously, if, the, you know, if your view of the reservoir used to be that the uncertainty range was this, and now you're having mm. actually... Is, it, is, it, is, it, is that a big issue nowadays, that companies are appraising less because drilling is so expensive? Um, I would have said initially, maybe 15 years ago, we saw a lot of aggressive appraisal. People backed away from it a lot. <coughs> BP had a lot, got its fingers burned a lot with some aggressive appraisal in west of Shetland development. Uh, um, it's public information. But, and, uh, but I think we are seeing an increase in more aggressive appraisal again in the deeper water. But, but again, I would say we think of it as aggressive or minimal appraisal. I think it wouldn't. Uh, I was at a at a at an investment forum in New York, and there were peop small companies trying to get money from investment bankers, and they were all shilling my greatest prospect here, and and one of the bankers came up and uh, and was talking, saying, if if you want, you you're, you're just asking for this much money for one well, I may as well go to, go to Las Vegas. I I would I. That's gambling on one well. I would never give you money on just one well. And I said, gosh, this banker knows this. I, and some of the project or ma management professionals we talk to don't understand the risk around having just one penetration in, yeah. in, in a field. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 OK. That's Anybody all. else? A couple of questions here, please.
With who? Yeah, Steve Norman, GL Noble Denson. Okay. Um, surely it's a catch-22 situation, though, for the smaller operators, where they've got to develop quickly to yes. get uh, funds coming in. <laughs> And the potential lack of evaluation of the full field then leads them into a position where investment decisions may be made around, should we say, conversions of older assets, uh, which then won't full, uh, see the full life of the field out as you then go into full production. I think the conversion is an appropriate response when you need to go fast, and there are reasons you need to go fast. But I think you cannot shortcut the basic hull inspection that, that we see, you just can't. It, it just argues, if, if, you, if you're saying, I'm trying to reduce risk, so I have to go fast, the best way to reduce risk is to actually do the engineering definition before sanction. Yeah. So. Do it right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, please, yeah. Marta Blinheim, Energy Growth Partners. Floating production systems have the opportunity for dry trees. Um, and I, so I guess a good chunk of yes. the wells drilled there will, will have dry trees. And the case for that is easier intervention, uh, yes. et cetera. Do, does your data tell you that that's part of the explanation for the better performance of the FPSs? Um, the data tells us about that. That specifically, I'm not sure in terms of the well cost performance or the well cost growth between the two categories, and that would be interesting to look at because you're right about the, cap the enhanced capabilities on the floating systems. But the data do tell us that we see a lot more majors involved in the floating production system sample, and their processes are probably forcing them to spend a bit more time up front to develop it, and they're viewing it as... A they seem to view it as more of an owned asset that they're responsible for. And the minute it's ship-shaped, a lot, even the majors, they start to say, this is not really in our realm, this is someone else's realm. And, and I, the best performing FPSOs, the owner had some naval architecture expertise on the team, on their team, not the contractor. The best performing ones, the owner had some naval, because they just behave somewhat differently than the, the floating production system. So it, it's often, the hands-off might be coming just it's a little bit what, this is just something that we don't always have the expertise in-house to, to deal with. But again, that would argue for some kind of risking of the fact that you're, in terms of your cost estimate, and I don't know if we're doing that. Um, one of the sort of suggestions I made in my earlier presentation was that conversions were becoming more of an issue because the stock of available ships yeah. to convert yeah. has changed. The, if you try to convert a ship nowadays, chances are it'll be double hull. Chances mm -hmm. are it'll be lighter steel weight and various other problems. Uh, was there anything in your um, in your research that suggested that over a period of time, conversions have become more difficult and, and there's been more problems with conversions? Um, been flat line I didn't line? look for a time trend here on the conversions, but I, I, I think it's worth looking at. We've just seen them routinely surprise in terms of steel requirements or rebound upgrade work mm -hmm. once once they're in dry dock and, and being inspected after you've made your estimate. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Gilbert, yeah. Yeah, I just want to make a comment on uh, the hands-off approach and why the FPSOs or the project perform worse in terms of production. Uh, one of my mentors used to tell me, uh, cheap, fast, and good, you can only pick two, yeah. right? So cheap, fast, and good, you pick two and you let the other one go the way it has to go. So effectively, it, uh, for, for a project like Jubilee to ensure the performance, we had to second our engineers sitting in Singapore in the shipyard with MODEC, who is the, uh, the FPSO contractors. We spend a lot of time up front on the front end engineering and design side, put a big major team, one of which is operability, we call it operation readiness and assurance team, which is a 30-year-old veteran from Shell, a friend of mine, sitting there, <coughs> making sure that every valve that is designed, every process is thought through, and it will work when it comes on stream. Even then, it was only a leased FPSO. So that's how we reduce the risk on performance when the project actually comes on stream. On the issue of dry tree versus uh, wet tree, if you look at Jubilee, yes, we underperformed, but it wasn't really the FPSO fault. It was in six months, we had an uptime of 
So the FPSO was available all the time. Not that maintenance was, uh, was nil. We were still doing maintenance and replacing equipment, but you, the uptime was 98%. We had problems on the wells. Because the project was fast, we didn't probably do all the studies that we had to do in order to cover all the bases, including the subsurface risk. The scaling tendency, somebody will have taken a sample, will have taken a course, will have, will have studied it in the laboratory, will have picked it up, and we will have known about it. If we took about 60 months, which in my previous company we used to took, if, if 60 months you executed a project like Jubilee, you were a hero. So, <laughs> so in my previous company we will have taken the time to do all these studies and uh, cover the basis, but we couldn't. And if you look at the payoff, we produce 68 million barrel out of $3 billion spent. So you do the math. Was it worth it or not? Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's often the quandary that we hear teams talk about. You know, we've been told that we can produce four months earlier. That's a lot of money to produce four months earlier. But sometimes I get the feeling that people are assuming that they will never produce those four months. It's just slipping by four months. And, and they, they almost chase it as if it, that's, that's lost forever and, and, and don't say that if I were to invest in this extra time, I might be able to forecast a more reliable production profile or I might, I might avoid some of the issues. I might be able to design for the well. It, we're not saying don't go fast, but we're saying you're not putting the right cost and schedule and production assumptions with your fast scenarios. And perhaps if you do that, then you're making a fair uh, and educated decision in those, in those choices. Okay. Thank All you. right. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Thanks for that. Okay. Uh